we've been talking about just for, twice. I know it seems like a long time. Last week I was I was in Leoma, Tennessee, ministering my 24th straight year, and uh, it's always good to know that we have faithful people to step in. Thank you, Shannon, uh, for uh, stepping in and uh, and doing that, and people that pray and stand and yes. <clears throat> It was a very, very powerful meeting, especially Wednesday. Uh, some of the healing, the anointing you saw here on Sunday morning, that's what, uh, that's what came up on me on a Wednesday night down there. It's just a lot fewer people that, uh, were, that were in the service. But it's been that way from last Wednesday through the weekend. It happened Sunday. And, and so God's been faithful. Uh, so that's my 24th straight year going, being down there. And um, it's out in the country. But they love Jesus. Amen. They love Jesus. So, uh, so we've been talking about this subject about how to, how to deposit into the kingdom of God. We talked about the kingdom of God and how to get a, how we're going to get a return. We're going to talk about returns. And the last time we're together, I really mentioned the tithe. I talked about the tithe and, and how God dealt with me about the tithe and where I was at and, and, and how the tithe wasn't holy and, and uh, so God dealt with my heart about how important uh, keeping the tithe right and uh, making sure things stayed in proper order. And so, and because of that, I've witnessed it. It's changed my life, and I know it's changed people's lives right here. And we tithe out of faith. Whatever we do, we do it by faith. And so I said, one way do we deposit is through is through that that holy tithe and. Uh, and how we do it there. And so then I want to move on over to an area that deals with giving to the poor. Giving to the poor. So if you notice when I pray, Brother Shannon mentioned tonight, that I'm always dealing with his holy tithe. It's not, it's not ours, it's his. Now there's one thing about the tithe. Uh, you know, people say that work and has business and makes a lot of money. You know, I have to pay more taxes than you because I make more money than you. And it's like people complain about having to pay taxes. And I'm not, I don't like to pay what I don't have to pay. But the truth is, uh, when I had to pay a little tax, that means I made just a little bit of money. And so I've heard people that's, that were nothing, that barely made ends meet and, and uh, just above poverty level. And God promoted them and blessed them to where they become 100, 200, 300, maybe 400,000 income people and complain about taxes. And the truth is, uh, I don't know if I'd complain. You know, you could go back to that fifty, eighty thousand $80,000 a year real quick. But uh, less, so there's a level of that that people, you know, will always complain about. But one thing in the kingdom of God, it doesn't matter how it works. Everyone is under the same standard, and that is the 10%. He's not going to, you know, it doesn't matter if someone makes 250000 They ought to tithe on they ought, they ought to honor God with his holy tithe, the 10%. And if you make 2,500, so by giving that, giving that tithe off 2,500, heaven honors the same way if somebody given the holy tithe off 250,000. Because it's not an amount. It's, an, it's a faithfulness and it's an honor thing from our heart. And we got to keep it holy. Amen. We got to keep it holy. And I know I've heard people say, well, uh, you know, my, my wife and I, we, we've been tithing 30 percent since uh, we've been married. Well, you don't tithe 30 percent. Now, you may use the word 30 percent, but the tithe is the tenth. You can call it what you want to. But it's that first tenth that uh, makes that tithe. So uh, you can go ahead and and say the other 25, the other 20 percent. You know, you can call it what you want to, but that's why I break it down when I pray his holy tithe, my gifts and my offerings, because the Bible says now give as its purpose in your heart. When it comes to the tithe, you can't do that. You can't do that. But in your heart, you give as its purpose in your heart, you know, and then so. When it comes to one part, there's a part that's very, that's very honorable to God. And another way to deposit it, which we have mentioned it in our introduction, and that is giving to the poor. So I just want to break down what does it really mean to give to the poor? Uh, 
so let's, let's look at it. I think I was going to start, uh, this was like number one, two, three, four, five down on my list, but I think I'm going to take five and make it the first one I, I read because I think it's going to help me, help us understand a little bit more. So, uh, turn with me to the book of St. John chapter 12, yeah. St. John chapter 12. There's a lot of good things in chapter 12, but I just want to read the first few verses here. I thank God that uh, people in this church has a revelation of the tithe. And if you don't, may the revelation of, may the revelation of it get on you and uh, be a part of it. Uh, so here we go. Uh, chapter uh, 12. Did I, tell you, did I say chapter 12? Yeah. All right. Verse 1. Then six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany where Lazarus who had been dead, whom he had raised from the dead. There they made him a supper, and Martha served, but Lazarus was one of those who sat at the table with him. And Mary took a pound of very costly oil, a spikenard, anointed the feet of Jesus, wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the fragrance of the oil. You know, it's been said by many, when you truly worship and honor God, it, it, ought, it, it ought to change the atmosphere. If there's, there's something about the atmosphere, it changed. But one of his disciples, guess who it is? The thief. The thief. Judas Iscariot. You know, he wasn't revealed to the Last Supper. But you're going to tell me Jesus didn't know what he was doing? I was talking to someone the other day, and we were talking about, you know, allowing people to just because you don't trust somebody doesn't mean that you don't ever you just keep them away from you or less it's an or less it's not safe you understand and I told him I said you know there's certain things we just have to do is walk in love I said even Jesus allowed Judas to hang around to the to the last supper even Jesus allowed Judas to hang around to the last supper Judas wasn't a threat at that time to Jesus or to the disciples, he had a wrong heart. Even the disciples didn't realize who it was, so it wasn't like he was proselyting their behavior. You understand? I said, so uh, even Jesus' love was so great that he allowed Judas to stick around to the Last Supper. But here's Judas again, all upset about money. All upset about money. But the one of his disciples, Judas... Iscariot, Simon's son, who would betray him, said, why was this fragrant oil not sold for 300 denarii and given to the... See, Jesus made a habit of giving to the poor. You know, the Bible doesn't say, which there's a scripture here. If I come to it, I may have you turn to it so we can underline it. But let's quote it because we've talked about it before. Those that give to the poor lendeth to the Lord. You know, it doesn't say those who lend to the poor give to the Lord. It don't say that. It said those who give to the poor, give, give, lendeth to the Lord. Now there's a difference between give and loan. I can give you something or I can loan you something. I've loaned people stuff, but they thought I gave it to them. I had a um, close people that I helped, ministry people, pastors of a church. Uh, they were always in trouble financially. This was many years ago. Preached for them. And um, they'd call me and say, you know, can you uh, loan us some money? I loaned them some money. You know, one time it was $1,000 and another time it was like $700. And uh, they'll pay you back and they didn't pay me back and asked again and I loaned some more money to him again and and uh, then I loaned some more money to him again. Three loans and uh, never got anything back. And so one day the wife called me and said, uh, we're going to have to uh, uh, we're going to have to vacate our our house because we're behind. 
Well, I'm a very compassionate person. I mean, you want to talk about giving, I, it doesn't matter what it is. Just, that's just how I'm wired. I don't want to see anybody out. But after three times, and uh, one time I did get a check, and I could play paddle ball with it. <laughs> and uh, so, uh, but anyway, so three times and then one at, you know, bouncy balled. Uh, when they called me, I'm thinking, I don't want them to get, leave the house. But they said, can I loan you money? Can you loan us some money? I said, listen, I, I love you guys. And uh, I'm going to pray for you. But I have no more money to loan. I didn't say I didn't have any money. I said, I have no more money to loan. For me to give you money, for me to send you a check, it would, it would be for me to take money that I could just give away. Because that's what I've been doing. Not expecting anything back. And the truth is right now, I don't have money in my account that I can just give away and not expect anything back. But one, two, three times I did. So sometime a loan can become a, a gift <laughs> unexpectedly. But it didn't say he that lends to the poor gives to the Lord. Now I've heard people quote that. It said they that give with no expectation to the poor now lend to the Lord. I can't lend to the poor. Why? If, if, I mean, if they had money to pay back, they wouldn't be poor. Now, people fall on hard times. I don't know anybody somewhere in their life didn't fall on hard times somewhere, and you climb up out of it. So it's not like we never fall on hard times. I've been there. I've talked about my poor folio. So it's not like I don't understand what it is to, to uh, want something. There's no way you can get it. I understand that. But there's something about giving, giving, giving to the poor that moved Jesus' heart. You know what I, one of the things I love about missions? What I love about missions is not that I just, not that I get to preach the gospel, people get born again, people get filled with the Holy Ghost, people get healed, miracles. You get to plant churches, you get to bring a place for a congregation to come together. That's all part of it. Do you know what I love about it? I love seeing God change the life of the poor. I stood right in the slums, right in the slums of Corgocho, and I preached on how God can change your financial world. I don't get up every day watching kids drink out of mud puddles. I don't get out every day watching kids may never have a pair of shoes and, and, uh, and, and, and uh, uh, urinate and defecate in a ditch right in front of their house. We don't live that way. Come on. We don't live that way. And when you watch that every day and you have somebody tell you that God can bring you out of it, you know there's no reference point to that at all for them to connect with. Think about it. No reference point. No reference. But you still preach. Jesus still preached the gospel to the poor. And I believe he preached it according to the anointing of God. He didn't just preach it. I, I believe he preached it. You don't have to stay this way anymore. See, you got to understand wealth for them may not be wealth for you. If you have your bills paid, current, you may not be out of debt. If you are current and you have loose change laying somewhere in addition to your house that you don't need, you are more wealthy than the majority of the world. You take the population of India. You take the population of, uh, of some of these countries that don't even live hand to mouth every day. What they work that day, that's what they buy food on the way home that night. Kenyans and other Africans, they, they eat very late. They eat supper very late. Why? Because they sell their wares. They sell vegetables on the side of the road. And on the way home, they buy that cornmeal so they can go make ugali and make some vegetables and cook them up at night because it's not like you buy Friday for the rest of next week. That is just unless you're a more of a middle class affluent family, what you work for that day, you labor that day for a few shillings and on the way home you get food and that's how you feed your family. Most people don't have to live that way. And so 
that gets my heart. Uh, I talked to someone that was going in doing home health care and helping people. They were not a nurse, but just kind of helping. And this elderly family that was living down, down on Main Street, not far north of town in Dayton. And they went in there and they said there was just two twin mattresses on the, on the floor, no furniture. And, and it was cold inside that apartment. And it was more in a ran down area. And it about made me cry. I mean, it's like I can't stand for elderly people to live that way. Folks, let me tell you. Uh, don't don't underestimate because sometimes we get it so good we don't think about what other people and i realize the first thing people say yeah but some people make their bed and have to lie in it sometimes people can't help being where they're at they just need help getting out of it and other times people are just flat stuck on stupid they just keep afflicting their self but there is a difference there is a difference There is a difference. And I believe Jesus recognized the difference. But this this man, Simon, I mean, this this, uh, Judas Iscariot, he didn't have any compassion for the poor. He was all about his pocket. Because it said he was taking money because he carried the, because he would carry the bag. Why was this fragrant oil not sold and given to the poor? This he said, not that he cared for the, uh uh-oh. See, you thought I was just making it up. Not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief. Because he was a thief. How many knows you don't allow a thief be your treasurer? (laughs) That's the wrong person to vote in his treasurer, a thief. Jesus had a thief as a treasurer. Isn't that something? And that's something I had a, a, years ago, 30 years ago, someone told us. I never dreamed I'd ever pastor. They told us, says, uh, you guys aspire to pastor? I just want you to know there's a possibility one out of every 12 may be a Judas in your church. I'm thinking, why would I, why, why, would, anybody, why would anybody want a pastor? That wasn't, I didn't find that comforting. Exhorting or encouraging. (laughs) Thank God I haven't found that to be true here at all. Amen. Amen. 15 years. I've not found that to be a true statistic at all. Amen. Let me get back to this. I'm thankful for that part. And he had the money box. He used to take what was put in it. Look at that. Judas is not getting a bad rap. He's just getting revealed. But Jesus said, let her alone. She has kept this for the, for the day of my burial. Look at the next one. For the poor you will have with you always, but me you do not have always. When I read that before, when he said, they that give to the poor lends to the Lord, I will always. Always be in a position by honoring the poor, lending to the poor. I will always be in a position for God to pay something, for God to give back. God says, you give to them, I'll pay you back. You give to them, it's like lending to me. I will make sure it's right. I've never got hurt by giving to the poor. Never. I have got beat by giving to the poor, thinking... You know, they were professionals, but my heart beat me, but God still honors. I took Brittany, one of the things she wanted to do, Brittany's a real sports fan, probably more so than her dad. And uh, she wanted to go for a graduation out of high school. She wanted to go to the New York Yankees. It was the last year, the last year before they tore down the old stadium. So we got to go to the original Yankee Stadium. So Brittany and I left here at five o'clock in the morning, flew to uh, New York. We landed in, uh, uh, no, not JFK, but, uh, huh? Yeah, LaGuardia. I got off there. I told the uh, taxi guy, because we were going to buy an all-day subway pass, two of them. I said, take me to the nearest subway station. Yes, sir. And uh, he dropped us off right in the middle of hell. 
That's what it seemed like. I said, whoa, my Lord, I should have I should explain myself a little bit where I want to be dropped off in New York. And uh, But we got on that subway, went into where we were going to stay at, and uh, we went down to through Grand Central and down to Times Square and went looking and spent all day with my daughter. And that night we were going to take the subway to Yankee Stadium, which lets you ride off at the stadium like Wrigley and uh, going to go there. And we got there early because she was a Derek Jeter fan and she wanted to see Derek Jeter warm up in the batting practice. And so we got to Yankee Stadium and bought her a blanket that had Yankees on it. We had, you know, Yankee dogs and we had all kind of stuff and yes and uh and the only bad thing about it was the Yankees lost to Tampa Bay that game but we left there it was so crowded it was a sellout crowd we had to it was like herding on that subway and this guy was on there preaching the gospel had an active audience man poor I mean, you look at him, you're thinking he just came right out of the, the gutter pour, preaching the gospel. God is good. Jesus can save your life. He's going down that subway cart, and nobody giving him any money. Well, as Scott calls me sometime, Marshmallow, uh, I pulled some money out. And, um, and he says... Uh, Something about uh, Brittany sitting there, and he said, uh, you got a lovely wife. <laughs> and I said, uh, sir, uh, I don't get, he doesn't have my money. I said, this is my daughter. He went, blankety, 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 blank, blank, blank. <laughs> I would have never guessed, I thought, and I just lost my reward. <laughs> I mean, you know, so there are, there are, I didn't know there was words like that he used. You know, so he was a, no one gave him money because they knew him. He was a professional guy on there, and I'm the only one that thought, I'm just going to give to the poor. So sometimes you get the bear, and the bear, no, offense. sometimes you get the bear, and the bear gets you. <laughs> Anybody ever got beat? <laughs> you gave? You know, I've always reminded of the guy down at this Red Stadium. He said, when you cross that bridge, everybody's got the homeless, other people got the homeless signs. You know, no food. And this guy's got this big sign that says, I'm not lying, this for beer. He has it. I'm not lying. This for beer. And people are throwing money at him, man. I mean, literally. The guy over there said, I'm homeless. Sir. He has nothing. You know, like the widow's mics, three little coins. And this guy's loaded down, man. I'm not lying. It's for beer. <laughs> what a spiritual teaching. But we're talking about the poor because not everybody says they're poor is poor, but there are poor. And Jesus knew the difference who was poor and the Holy Spirit in us knows who needs help. And it's not just the holy tithe. It's also giving to the poor. It's also giving to the poor. And uh, I thank God for the opportunity that we have. Proverbs 19, 17 is the verse, he that giveth to the poor, lend it to the Lord. You can write that down and read it. We won't turn there. Uh, let's go to Luke uh, 4. Uh, you can write down Proverbs nineteen seventeen, but Luke 4. Uh, I've shared this story before that uh, I use this example as uh, Galatians 6 people. The Bible says in Galatians 6, do not be deceived for God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Is that right? He that sows to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. He that sows to the flesh shall reap corruption. You can turn them around. Put them in the order you want. Therefore, don't grow weary in well-doing, for you shall reap if you faint not. Do good unto all men, especially to those who are the household of faith. So that tells me that we have the right 
to do good to everyone. There's not a thing that if somebody is a non-Christian, it's wrong to do good to them. There's there's something wrong with people thinking that you cannot help someone that's not saved. It's just the other day. Well, just the other day, I mean, just about two or three weeks ago, Angel and I were out to dinner and uh, this lady that waited on us just moved her heart. And the truth is, we gave her more money than what our bill was. The point is, our heart was touched, was touched. I may never see her. She may never see me and say, you know, you did that. I want to bless you back. But my God, my God knows. My God knows. The other day I wanted to do something special for someone and, and I done give something away and I had extra money I was going to do it. And so uh, I'm thinking, man, I, I just committed that and I was going to give that away to help somebody. But the truth was, Sunday morning, there was a card laying here with my name on it and the very thing that I'm thinking, I just need some help here. My God knows. Let me tell you, you cannot give, you cannot help somebody, you cannot help make somebody's dreams come to pass without your God helping send somebody to help you fulfill your heart. You want to talk about depositing into the kingdom of God? You got to get active in someone's life. The kingdom was about people. There's one thing that the church, there's no room in, there's no room for it in the church of Jesus Christ, and that's selfishness. There's no room for recklessness of it either. You know, I don't believe every believer that you sow into has a great return. But they're soils that always has a great return. You understand? Chapter four, God is so good. I get to reminiscing about how God has brought things my way. It's not, I mean, it's, it's supernatural. I know what it is for somebody to chase me down an area that's never been in to give me money. Chase me down, hey, and chase me down. I'm telling you, God is faithful if you keep your heart right. You keep your heart right. I, I've, Lord's dealt with me to give, and literally, my heart started palpitating because I knew oh, this, is, uh, this is stretching me, stretching me. It wasn't the tithe. It was God setting me up. My heart was palpitating. It was, it was stretching me. I told someone one time, I said, God is God stretching me. God is stretching me so far right now. I'm gonna, he's going to pull every spiritual muscle I got if you don't, it don't ease up here. That's how I put it because, you know, you stretch someone. You stretch your arms back eventually. You say, oh, oh, that's enough. But I'm telling you what, God doesn't do it to get something from you. He does it to get something to you. It's so good. It's so good. I'm telling you, God, Ken and Angel Harbaugh is blessed. I'm so thankful to God. I'm so thankful to God. I'm so thankful. God is so good. Um, we got to get on this. Verse 16. You get to reminiscing, man. You get to thinking about where you came from and where you are now. Come on. Uh, it's, it, it, it just gets your heart. So he, Jesus, verse 16, came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. We've read these scriptures so many times you could probably quote them with me. As his custom was, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. And he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the very place. I like to put there were very in the very place where it was written. The spirit of the Lord is upon me for he has anointed me. The first thing he mentioned was to do what? Preach the gospel to the poor. He didn't say heal the blinded eye, open the blinded eye, heal the brokenhearted. There's something about it. I believe it was in order to preach the gospel to the poor. I believe it. 
I believe it. You know what I've prayed here many times? God, I thank you that coming to Peace Church, that you recommend us to the down and out, but you also recommend us to the up and in. Because if you don't have the up and in, you can't help the down and out. It takes people that have to help people that don't. But you got to understand, at one time, 400 men came to David in a cave when David was already depressed. It has said everyone was in debt, discontent, and uh, discouraged or something like that. Not one of them was living in victory. It said David became a captain over him or came their pastor. But every one of them became great men of valor, became his mighty men. So it doesn't matter where you have been, where you are, you got the ability to be what God created you to be. Amen. If you're willing to go the route, stay the course, you're willing to do that, amen? And so... Uh, what a, what a way to start a church. 400 people shows up the first day. My God, look at that. We got 400 people. But all 400 people are in debt, discontent, and disgruntled, discouraged. I mean, who would want to pastor that bunch? But David took the challenge, and they became his mighty men. Glory to God. I think I understand that feeling. Not that part, but know what it is to have mighty men and people. To do that. There, there's something fulfilling about that. He preached the gospel to the poor. Now I've always said, now what did he preach to the poor? The same thing he preached to the other ones. He was sent to heal the brokenhearted. So if you're brokenhearted, you don't have to be brokenhearted no more. To proclaim liberty to the captives. If you're a captive, you don't have to stay captive. He to preach the covering sight to the blind. What do you preach to a blind person? You don't have to stay blind anymore. Right? To set, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. So if ever one of the other ones he preached to said you can have the opposite, why wouldn't he be saying the same thing to the poor? Poor man, listen, you don't have to stay poor no more. Amen? But you know some people will fight to the right to be poor. I talk to people. Now, if this, there's, I don't know anybody in here that said this to me, so no one should get bothered by what I say. But I had somebody came to me one time, and um, I say that because I don't know what everybody's confession is and what they've done. So I don't say this because I know somebody here has done it. But a guy came to me one time, and he uh, got hurt on a job, and he was drawing Social Security, unemployment Social Security, and because of, you know, being hurt. And uh, it's, uh, uh, what's that money you get when you're hurt? Not workman's comp, but it's a disability. Thank you. Disability. And, uh, but, to, but don't like the pain and want to get healed. And so I talked to him. I said, you know, God can totally heal your body to where you've never had this. And I saw it on him. You know what he, you know what he admitted? But if I got healed, I'd lose my disability. Then I have to go back to work. You know... Until he changed his mindset, even the Lord can't help him. Even Jesus could do no mighty works because of people's unbelief. He didn't say he would not, I said he could not. So let me tell you, some people you can help, you can help, you can help, and you never change them. I understand that. But you know there's people looking for a way out? There's people looking for a way out. Looking for a way out. So he came to preach the gospel to the poor. All right, let's close. I don't know if we'll get through all of it. Let's, let's, close, let's talk to another story that I love. Uh, it's in the, it's, let's look at the account of it. There's a, it's a couple places. But go to the book of Matthew's account, Matthew 19. Matthew 19's account. This is a story about a rich young guy. A rich young guy. And... Uh, so this is a story about this rich young guy. Verse 16, now behold, one came, said to him, good teacher, what good thing shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? Now, how many knows that's the most important question somebody can ask? It's not how I can just be healed, how I can be rich. The most important thing for us is to have what? Eternal life. How can I inherit eternal life? How many knows that's the most important question someone can ask? You're looking at Brother Ricky said there. His 
stepdad HL. He knows that God could heal him, but this man has rejected God all of his life. Just this week or so, I think Ricky's mother, Ricky told me his mom says something about, we'll pray for you. And he said, okay. It's almost like that's the first time he's ever came close to anything to that. So the, the prayer is that he comes out to hear the gospel to get born again. That's the thing. Eternal life. Life's eternal. Eternally in hell or heaven. It's, your life's going to be eternal. We're talking about eternal life, not eternal death. So he said to him, why do you call me good? No one is, no one is good but one that is God. But if you want to enter into life, keep the commandments. How many know Jesus put great value on the commandments? I'm not talking just the big ten. He said, he that keeps my commandments, keeps my word. Jesus said to him, which, uh, he said to him, which ones? Jesus said, you shall not murder. That's a good place to start. How many knows murder is not just homicide? It's hatred. It is. It's hatred. It's hatred. But not everybody that said they hate, hate. Some things it's emotional. So you shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. How many knows that's not just natural adultery with humans? You shouldn't commit spiritual adultery either. What do you mean spiritual adultery? Serve this God, that God. Let the world be your God one day and God the other day. Money's your God, wealth and business and, and, uh, and uh, you know, career. And then you get into trouble, then you run back to God. No, you don't want to. It's God. You need God. You need to serve God and God only. Amen? Not to, I shouldn't preach on each one of these. You shall not steal. You should not steal. That's from anyone else or the Lord's tithe. Stealing, stealing, man. You shall not bear false witness. Honor your father and your mother, and you shall and shall love your neighbor as yourself. Listen to this kid. The young man said to him, All these things I have kept from my youth. What do I still lack? So that tells me if he mentions you should not commit adultery, uh, you should not commit all of these things. After this point, this kid's got it going on. He's clean. He's clean in his heart with his parents. He's clean in his heart with how he loves people. He's clean sexually. I mean, all these things. He said, I've got it going on, man. He said, I'm in. I'm done. He should have just stopped right there. It's the second question. If you want to ask a second question, you're going to be challenged at a second level. So I, after studying this, I'm thinking per, the, somebody's first question can be surface. It's that second question that sets them up to what they really are looking for in their heart. Somebody ought to write a book on it's the second question that matters. He says, so what do I still lack? He still wants to know. Jesus said to him, if you want to be perfect or mature, go sell what you have and give to your rich buddies. Know what he say? Give to who? Isn't that amazing? He didn't say. He mentioned all of these commandments, but he says, what else do I lack? Go sell everything. Now, he was already called a what? This was this rich we're going to find because his wealth was great. He was a rich young ruler. Go sell and give to the poor. The who? The poor. And you will have treasures in heaven. How many knows you just deposited? And come follow me. Wow. You realize the only people Jesus said come follow me are the ones who became his disciples, his apostles? Now, I got a question. Maybe, just maybe, 
this would have been a better option than Judas as a treasurer. He knew how to handle money, didn't he? He'd already proven it. Jesus said to him, come follow me. You know, I don't find anywhere else he said, come follow me until the ones he actually made the 12 apostles of the Lamb. Just maybe, just maybe, this guy would have been a great replacement or the one that would have done a better job. I'm not trying to come up with a false doctrine. I'm just saying, Jesus said, sell all you have and come follow me. The only time he told people come follow him is the one he told Matthew, come follow me. He told Peter, come follow me. When these people, James and John, leave what you have, come follow me. Now, this is the only other one that's not part of this 12 apostles that we know that he still said, come follow me. Look at the criteria. I'm going to judge you. I'm going to judge your heart right here. Sell everything you have and give to the poor. According to Proverbs, what do you think would have happened? He that giveth to the poor lends to the Lord. Come on, could you tell me what God would have done supernaturally for this rich young ruler? Oh, my, 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 my. He may have been the New Testament Solomon. I don't know. But Jesus said, don't just give it to anybody. Give to the poor because you're going to be treasures. Laid up treasures. Now, you know, I'm not just looking for treasures in heaven. I need, to have, I need something to operate here. I don't need a credit card when I get to heaven. It's all paid for. The house is already set. Daddy already paid for it. Come on. The utilities are already covered. Don't need, don't need lights because it's never dark. I'm telling you, there's something about heaven. I don't need it in heaven. I need to know how to get the resources to operate here. To operate here. It says, no man has ever left house, mother, father, kids, you name it. No person that has ever disconnected and left that for my sake and the kingdoms that they shall not receive a hundredfold in this lifetime, in this place, in this place, and also in heaven. So it didn't say it's just going to be heaven. It said in this lifetime, in this lifetime, and life eternal. So we need something right here, right? But then he said, you'll receive a hundredfold with persecution. Now, I left that out to the end because I've liked, I heard an old man. He's an old man then. He's really old now. He said, uh, we were sitting one day and just talking. He said, now, when God begins to bless in this lifetime with persecution, that's the carrying charge, young man. If you don't want the carrying charge, then you're not going to get it. So that means you've got to keep walking with God and don't care what people do to you. You've got to keep it right. So uh, with persecution. So then he says, Come follow me. But when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, for he had what? Great possessions. Go sell all and give to the poor. Go sell all and give to the poor. Now, I realize it doesn't matter how much we're able to give as an individual. You know, come to think about it, I've been here 15 years. Most of you've been here the whole time. I don't get up, make a big deal over the the offering. Even in the missions conference, I help about. I don't take a long time to receive offerings. God put in my heart how to do it. We come to His off His altar. We know what to say. When you come, you say. We bring the holy tithe, our gifts and offerings. I had pastor friends that's been here in special service said I've never seen anybody take such little time and say the most simple things and watch how God does your church financially. He said, I've never witnessed anywhere, 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 anywhere. So the truth is, if we keep our heart pure with money and don't let money mess with us, God will trust us in everything we do. When I say us, I'm not talking about just the church, us. 
everything. He'll trust you with it. You know, I, you know I have my faith connected with your wealth? It's not just what happens with these baskets. My faith is connected with you. When, when our farmers leave the foyer and says, Pastor, we need to turn that rain off. We need to get some rain. We need to have some sunshine. I take it to heart, man. There's times I called them. I said, I'm praying. When it looks like nothing's changing, I'm praying. Why? Because I have to have my faith with their blessing because without them being blessed, then it can't affect everything else. My faith is with the Bears. My faith was with Ken and Sally. My faith was with Senator Ross. My faith was with all of you. If I don't have time to name all of you, my faith is with all of you. Well, uh, the saying that we had, I need to stop here. The saying that people have is, well, you know, I'm limited. I'm on a fixed income. Well, we're all on a fixed income. I'm on a fixed income. Pastor, you're not on a fixed income. I am. I have a salary. Fixed. I don't go to the board and say, I need more money this month. Now, people may bless me. I realize that in my position, I'm not foolish. There's birthday cards, there's anniversary cards, and people do things. But, but you have birthdays, you have anniversaries. You may not have, but you have people. See what I'm telling you, that where our faith is, God can still cause people to chase you down. You don't have to keep the concept, I'm retired, I'm fixed. You keep your giving right, and you will unfix your fix. It may not happen overnight, but you keep your heart right, you keep your giving right, watch what God can do. Folks, if he can send ravens, dirty birds, to a prophet to meet his needs, you tell me that God doesn't know where you live, and he can't send what you need to put you where you're at and provide your missions, pledge money, the, your faith promise money, provide the things that you want to do. I'm telling you, my God shall supply why? Because he's faithful. Amen. Let's stand together. I'm about ready to preach myself happy. <laughs> <laughs>